The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is Thomas Goss, welcoming you back to our fourth and final lecture on Jupiter, the bringer of jollity. And I just feel really happy about this whole piece and about doing this lecture. It was really, really fun, and I think that's partially just because the music is so fun. This piece is so monumental and so joyous that, in fact, in the early days of the planets being performed, it was requested of Holst to put Jupiter last in performance order. And Holst's reaction to that was that the concert promoters were almost trying to deny the way that life works, as if life were going to be jolly at the very end, when they knew darn well that it wasn't going to be. So if you look at it that way, it seems almost as if he looked at Jupiter being part of a certain passage of life, that it was an expression of fulfillment, representing the culmination of one's personal power and influence in life. And I suppose, being followed immediately by Saturn, the bringer of old age, makes things a lot more realistic. Aging being a natural process, of course, and then being followed by Uranus and Neptune pointing toward magic and mysticism as one lets go of life. I don't really see it that way myself. I see each of these movements as separate pieces, separate essays on mood, emotion, and orchestral color. So with that in mind, let's look at the way that Holst reviews some of his material. As I was saying before, once you get past the middle of the piece, that hymn that we studied in the last lecture, Pretty much the rest of it is going to be review, except for a few changes made here and there. So we could just blast through this and not really pay attention to the minute changes that Holst made here or there. Or we could really look how Holst makes it interesting, not just by changing the key here and there and changing the harmonic context of different passages as they're repeated in the structure, but also the changes in orchestration and textural context. Starting here, notice... Dun 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 da 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 The original statement of this particular phrase in the context of where it's sitting was all expressed in strings. But now Holst changes the way that it's orchestrated by having the melody in violas, English horn, and third bassoon, while the first and second bassoon play the harmony on top. And it gives the phrase a really muted sound. Uh, not really dull, but just has kind of the nose cut off of it, if you know what I mean, in terms of resonance. And it's a nice way to score something if you want a sort of covert sound or a calming sound. Whereas before, Holst had scored the reaction all in winds. It starts off in violas and second violins, and then bridges over to low flutes, which I think is really a lovely idea, whereas before the flutes had been kind of reacting, um, I guess, around the same area, but then the piccolos had kind of built on top of their reaction. So here it's just more of a little echo effect lower down. Now the same thing follows going on to the kind of reaction, right, to the, the phrase being echoed in kind of saucier instruments. In the original, Holst had scored this for oboes and bassoons sort of doubling each other at the octave in triads, with the bass clarinet and cello doubling each other in a kind of back and forth, bup, 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 little pace-keeping ostinato. But here, the ostinato goes to bassoon and contrabassoon going back and forth in thirds and then jumping up at the end, which the original ostinato did not do. And it's just very simple lower oboes and English horn all sort of playing together in a very concrete type of voicing. Immediately, the horns react. Now, if you compare the two different places in the score, you might think, okay, oh, well, this is just the same exact place that it was before, except for the fact that this is horns, which sound down a fifth. And in the original, it was trumpets, 
on their written D, which is an actual concert D, right? So the horns come in, and everything is sort of down a fifth at first, and then up a fourth as the trumpets take over. So the trumpets are in a higher place, and they don't really push with as much force as we get to the end, because in the original interpretation of this passage, it ended with all four trumpets playing and the upper strings lending some pizzicato to the gradual building suspended chords in the upper winds. But here it's just upper winds and trumpets. Now, the voicings for these suspended chords are lower by about a perfect fourth, and that means that the trumpets are going to be playing right over <laughs> these chords here, and it does work because Holst backs off a little bit on the thickness of how many trumpets are playing at once. So that means that the upper winds can provide a nice background. Let's have a listen to that now, and maybe listen to each page as I go, even though we're really recapping a lot of material, just so that you can hear these minute differences that I'm talking about. So think about all of those things, the suspended chords being walked right over by the trumpets, and the horns entering instead of the trumpets at the wrap-up to the passage, and then the different interpretations here as well, especially this wonderfully muted sound here with English horn, bassoon, and violas all playing unison together, and the way that this unfolds, but only up to the lower and middle register of the flutes. I find that to be a wonderful effect, and one that's been imitated by cinematic orchestrators. Listen to all that, and I'll see you on the next screen. On this next page, we see a really strong departure from the orchestration approach of the previous entrance of this particular theme. Bum, 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 bum. The first time that little setup phrase had introduced us to the horns, A6, playing along to a strong downbeat by all of the string sections. Holst reinterprets it now in a really fresh way, I feel. Instead of arco strings smashing on the downbeat, we've got pizzicato strings. And there's one cool thing about this. Notice there are a lot of C flats. This music has modulated to D flat major, and that means that this chord here is going to be G flat minor. And of course, as you might be thinking harmonically, G flat minor is the same thing as F sharp minor, which means that the minor third has to be interpreted as A in F sharp minor, which is B double flat in G flat minor. And you might be thinking, well, why don't you just write that as an A natural? And that is because of fingering positions. The second violinist is holding down a finger position for these notes, and this could be accomplished by first position on the A string or a higher position on the D string, but whichever way, uh, probably the latter, the player is going to want to think diatonically. So that means that double flats and double sharps are actually your friend, right? They aren't something to necessarily be avoided just because you're trying to make things easier for the player. It does not actually make uh, things easier at all to throw them A natural instead of B double flat. The problem is that if you throw them an A, they are going to need an extra finger, or they are going to use the wrong finger, or they might have to readjust a finger, right? So it's better just to give them the notes as they would appear normally in a diatonic sequence, even if it means that they're completely transposed and so on, like this. I'm actually making this into an orchestration tip because I'm seeing this happen all too often where well-meaning composers will supply a natural instead of a double accidental. 
Okay, so moving forwards, what are these pizzicati supporting? Well, if we look here, instead of ah six horns on one melody, we've got this very ploinky kind of a wind octave. And basically it's piccolos on top, flutes in the middle, oboes below, doubled by clarinets. And along with them, this sort of beautiful triple octave, which has a piquant sound. I know I use the word piquant a lot, but it's really good for describing a certain kind of sauciness <laughs> that the winds can do that like no other instrument. Just kind of slightly naughty, slightly teasing. Or to put it into sensory terms, maybe a flavor that is a little tart, if you know what I mean. So there's a kind of a tart sound to this. And it is being accompanied by glockenspiel. Now, if we remember that the glockenspiel transposes two octaves, these notes are being played at the same exact pitch as the piccolo right here. What's cool here is that the glockenspiel doesn't seem too sweet. It doesn't seem like Christmas shopping music that much. And that is because the presentation of the idea is uh, so saucy, so tart. I suppose you could think of this as being Christmassy, naughty elves or something like that, but I don't see it that way at all. I see it as mischief in a very endearing way, and that mischief is being perpetrated by Holst, because some people in the audience listening to this were expecting the horns to come in and just really blast away at this 3-4 melody again, and he has pulled the rug out from under them. Now that is followed by a much less complex interpretation of these cascading figures and the statement of the melody. Now, if you remember, these cascading winds, which were voiced differently and were in a different key, in G major rather than in C major, like we've got here, they were essentially the icing over fairly complex things happening in the horns and trumpets, where the trumpets were playing the melody in octaves, and the horns were playing a sort of syncopated figure behind them, you know, bum, 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 kind of thing. And, of course, we had tambourine and so on. So here we have the strings hitting the downbeat here in very, very easy triple stops, I have to say. You know, these are just open fifths, plus we've got the harmonic note there of E natural, and then this G right on top of here, which is easy to finger on the second string and so on. And then we've got these G sixths with a C on top. That's also a very easy chord to play on mandolin. Anyhow, these strong downbeats are providing the first note of the melody. So wham, dun, 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 wham, dun, 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 dun. Then finally, the horns do play the downbeat note of the melody as two trumpets come in. And here's where you get a sort of a pushier tone than the normal one that you get when you combine trumpets with horns. You may have noticed another thing that I say a lot, and that is that the trumpets added to the horns have a sort of a golden sound. But that's not the same thing that's happening here, because the trumpets are playing A2 an octave above what the horns are doing A6. So what you get is really kind of more of a crowing sound from the trumpets. Kind of like kids sort of yelling lustily together. That's, that's the way that I kind of interpret this sound. Notice how the horns come together at the end with the trumpets. Holst does not allow the horns to get too low. Like, if you were going to keep this octave consistent then the 
trumpets playing this D here above middle C would be accompanied an octave lower with the horns playing written A below the staff, which is actually not a big deal. Uh, it's a slightly coarser sound. But Holst decides to telescope the line. So the horns are jumping up an octave from where they would be just so that they can double the trumpets in what he seems to consider to be a sort of weaker area. Holst really tries to double up his trumpets when they get down to around middle C, whether it's adding a trombone, as we've seen before, or this particular strategy here. And the thing is that the lower part of the octave disappearing into where the trumpets are at in terms of their pitch is completely unnoticeable. Like if you, if you're listening to this, you might not even notice it unless you were really paying attention and listening for that particular thing. And in fact, let's do that now. Um, like I said before, we're going to be taking our music breaks more and more often just so that we can notice those slight differences. So listen for the strings supplying the downbeat to the melody and listen for the lower horns telescoping into the trumpets there. And if you do not know what the word telescoping means, it is a very old British term meaning kind of putting things together into a smaller place. Back from the days when a lot of enthusiasts had telescopes of their own and they would take them out stargazing. And in this case, it would just basically be a tube with a lens at either end that collapsed. So each tube would collapse into the other. If you wanted to use the telescope, you would just pull on one end and it would turn into a tube that was the right length to observe the stars. So that's where the word telescoping comes from to condense certain elements into each other. And that's just what I mean in this context, if you didn't know the word. Probably half of you are just waiting for me to shut up about it. So I will go on and also say, listen to the way that this all works. And one other thing that I didn't mention is how just having this sound kind of so spicy where it is, um, so penetrating with the way that the upper overtones tend to work together and the glockenspiel along with it. It gives the illusion that pizzicato is continuing on for the entire passage in a certain way, almost as if all of these notes are plucked to a degree, but it's just because of the strength of the illusion, things that you may be taking for granted with your ear that aren't really there, which is something Holst was experimenting with along with uh, Debussy and other composers of that time. So have a listen to that, and I will return on the next screen. So once again, a massive page of orchestration, which is actually pretty simple when you consider just functions. If you just break it down into functions, it's actually a very straightforward piece of orchestration. And I would say that that is how tutti should be, how massive tutti should be. There's a tendency of the ear to become overwhelmed and the imagination of the listener to become overwhelmed as well, and to imagine that massively orchestrated music is necessarily complex. Actually, I would say that massive music is, or should be, necessarily simple, to the degree that the players are able to hear enough of each other's parts to relate to each other very, very well. A big riotous page is actually much more complicated to put together, such as the last couple of pages of the introduction to part one of the Rite of Spring. That is a situation where practically everybody is doing something different from everybody else, and that takes a lot of putting together sometimes. If the players aren't experienced with it, I would say like, you know, the rehearsals for a conservatory or university orchestra where everybody is really tackling it for the first time, even though they've heard it quite a lot in their studies, they are actually pr approaching it for the first time as players. That's where I would say the, that's a situation where 
the conductor would really have to take a lot of time to make sure that that was really, really well rehearsed. And even in situations where people have played it dozens of times professionally, the conductor still has to really make sure that everybody is watching at the right time for the right downbeat and those gestures which help to unify the ensemble. But in this case, that isn't a concern because what do you have? Bum, 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 bum being played across a certain spectrum of instruments, and then the melody, and the counter melody, and the downbeats, and so on. So we've studied the way that this particular passage worked before, so I'm not going to get into that too much, but I'm just trying to say, don't get intimidated when you see a massive page of orchestration like this. So, as we saw before, the music had returned in the key of C as opposed to G. The orchestration is somewhat different as well. Whereas before, we really just had as melody instruments the tenor tuba and the string section, minus the double bass, of course. Here we've got tenor tuba as before, strings as before, but we also have bass clarinet and bassoon and it gives the quality of the music just that much more ruddiness, if you know what I mean. There is a kind of plaintiveness to this area of the bassoon when you play it softly, which becomes very much like a joyous cry when you are tripling it and then adding bass clarinet to those same pitches. So that's what I mean by ruddy. It's sort of like a reddening of the cheeks in the color of this passage. When you add that together with tenor tuba and the strings playing lower, it really has this wonderfully aggressive grind to it, which is something I want you to listen for when we have a listen to this page in just a few minutes. Notice how there are dropouts in the violins. Bum, 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 bum. Then playing a little harmonic interval rather than dipping down to D, right? If the alternate chord here is G minor, then we might as well just have the violins contribute to the harmony of G minor and allow the violas to continue on with the cellos. Now, notice that this is all out of the range of the violins, these three notes right in here. So it's better just to leave them be. And to let them contribute to this downbeat, the tonic of G, as we see in the lower bass instruments, and then the minor third of B flat. And it's really not going to be heard that much, but it's just a way of bringing the melodic motion of the violins to a stop, instead of having them go nowhere and then feel like there is a gap here, right? This is just the kind of patching up job that we orchestrators have to do to make things feel completely natural so that you don't notice the fact that the violins have dropped out. The same thing happens here. Ba 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 da dum ba da dum and they obviously can't go ba da da dum bum. So they just play another G minor chord, this time G fifth in the first violins and the B flat in the seconds. At this point, the tenor trombones come in and they add some weight here, but they are not compensating for the lack of violins. They are compensating to a certain degree because Holst is hedging his bets. He considers this low area in here, as it would be played by tenor tuba or euphonium, to be kind of a possibly weak area. Maybe experiencing that from working with euphoniums in band where they were not the strongest and also being aware that tenor tuba was not the most common visitor to the orchestra. He's just really making sure that it's going to end strongly and also that the tenor trombones are going to be able to lend a big push, right? So the crescendo here is coming from the tenor trombones. You know, ba da da bum all they have to do is just crescendo there. It doesn't really matter about anybody else. And then this fortissimo coming here after the forte and mezzo forte passage is going to make perfect sense. So let's talk about how that passage follows. 
just looking back very quickly to trumpet bum, 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 and notice that this is not on a D it's on starting on a G right so the fifth of C and being answered by the flutes and oboes clarinets and so on not too different from what happened before now here we've got pretty much the same orchestration as before with one or two little differences slamming those down beats with bass clarinet and bassoons contra bassoon and big massive chords from the horns as well right here we've got cellos basically playing a big quadruple stop what's going on here is in terms of a difference is that the violas are not contributing the violas were playing triple stops and quadruple stops before but now the cellos are sort of taking the place for both the little downbeats that they were playing in the previous uh, iteration of this idea plus adding these stacks of extra pitches which sort of represent the missing violas then on top just like before we've got piccolo flutes oboes clarinets okay so that is pretty much identical what's different is the way that the piccolos are playing higher pretty much everybody is playing in a higher tessitura except for the oboes and the clarinets so we have a triple octave rather than a double octave that we had before okay that's all good and that explains why the violas are needed that's because we've got that lowest voice of the octave that needs to be helped out and these piccolo notes up here are just way too high for the violins to contribute to them and would become meaningless just high squeaking sounds that the violins would be playing at that speed and that kind of force so it's better just to have the first and second violins contribute to a big unison here with the violas an octave lower and it sounds fine I mean if you really were fussy about this and wanted to balance it you could have the seconds divisi playing octaves right so a, a lower octave of half the second violins would be contributing to the viola part but that's really not needed glockenspiel is also joining in and that pretty much takes care of the bum 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 idea and then the melody once again is in trumpets now notice how Hulse is once again really trying to avoid playing middle C with his trumpets he does get around to adding a middle C down here but yeah he just really wants the force to be in the sweet spot for the trumpets which is pretty much what you're reading right there that would be a wonderful place for any trumpet line which I would say would be the lower part of this octave going to the upper part here you know avoiding the outside too much so he avoids the outside note of C and the outside notes of high C here when he can but he can't get away with it all the time right so he's got to throw in an A and a B flat here and there but this is where they get the strongest right this off four trumpet part once again it's got a counter melody with the tenor trombones they were originally playing this starting on the note A here they are starting on the note D all par for the course there's really no big deal about that at all but it all fits together really really well now let's move on once again you know this is very very much like before with one or two little twists that are different the trumpets take over a four on the counter melody this time rather than kind of being split up in their duties between one or two different things and the horns do not play the counter melody along with the trumpets they just go bum 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 along with the lower heavy brass for the most part and that just gives a rock solid feeling just like before timpani are basically playing kind of a melodic bass and pretty much getting all the pitches as well right it really helps to have six or seven kettles if you have that many you can pretty much play any diatonic line maybe with the occasional note left out and with that let's have a listen to this whole page now 
and there isn't a whole lot really to remind you of that I haven't just gone over already. But maybe listen for the depth of the strings, that very tawny sound as the violins play as low as they possibly can in unison with the other strings, and the added bassoons here, possibly also just how much brighter this triple octave is than the first example of this phrase. And I will see you on the very last couple of screens for the very end of Jupiter, the bringer of jollity. On this next page, we see an example of what I was talking about early on in this series of lectures on Jupiter, which is Hulse's wonderful sense of form. And here he's bringing back the hymn. Remember, ba bum ba dee da ba bum 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 And he has to say it one more time before this piece rolls to a finish. So he brings the tempo down just briefly for five bars to lento and has this wonderful exploration of sound. This is Holst at his most cinematic, I think. So let's look at that theme and the way that it is scored out there. Bassoons and contrabassoon being played in their lower registers this time, along with bass clarinet, just sort of solidifying things, added there for some tone weight. Not that it's really contributing all that much. And this is bass trombone and bass tuba in octaves, basically playing the same octave that the bassoon and contrabassoon are playing. Same thing here in the strings exactly, which pretty much adds up to nearly every bass instrument playing all the way together. Uh, tenor tubas and tenor trombones not included this time. As the register goes perhaps a little lower than could be counted on at the time. Thinking about how many players really had F triggers for their trombones, right? Or whether or not this tenor tuba or euphonium could really play all that low. Another thing that, remember, seems to be a concern with Holst, right? So we've got all of the incredibly dependable bass instruments playing this wonderful idea here now right in the middle of that the <laughs> trumpets come in and they basically play a cannon with this coming in three bars later Right, and this is going to lead to a big upsweep, but we'll get to that in a second. We want to pick apart these five bars because they really are the most interesting part about the ending of this. Here's where we're seeing the music being recapped in really brilliant ways and entirely new approaches in our orchestration. So here is the harp just basically playing harmonized arpeggios at a sixth apart, right? or for generally a sixth apart, though that will change as it goes through different parts of the particular chord they're using as a framework. But just as a really beautiful sound, and they're playing fortissimo, okay? And everybody else is probably playing a bit softer than that. Here we've got lovely arching arpeggios in the violins, and these are not harmonic glissandos, okay? They're, they're similar to harmonic glissandos, but they're not harmonic glissandos, and they're just kind of going back and forth. And they're playing at a different frequency to the flutes and clarinets, and just basically ripping over this slower. And I just really love the randomness of this. It you know, this wonderful sweeping color that is going back and forth. So it's similar in a way to that 
opening wallpaper that had a sense of randomness, right? So there's a sense of randomness here with the harps and flutes and clarinets going over one kind of arcing pattern and the violins playing at a different frequency entirely. And it just has this wonderful bustle. This is Holst's heart that he's showing you. And it's one that is almost entirely an orchestral idea. If you listen to this on piano, it, it sounds kind of cool. It sounds sort of nice and icy and glittery, but it is obviously something that he was thinking about from the beginning as being an orchestral idea, which he put into his piano sketch. He had, I'm sure, very firm ideas of how he was going to interpret this. One other little note before we move on, and that is just the wonderful cushion of horns. If you wanted to know what a really great horn pad sounds like, here's one right here. All right, so that wonderful harmony in the back, the cushioning harmony, and then the oboes and English horns joining in <laughs> with the trumpets. Uh, they're barely going to be heard with the trumpets playing fortissimo, a ah, two, but they still add a little teeny bit to the tone. And they also include these players, too, whether they are going to be heard all that well or not. So that is a further consideration that you have got to think of, right? Notice how the English horn drops out instead of playing the B-flat that follows, the written B-flat, in order to join in on this E-flat here with the oboes. But they do come back in right here with this upward rip, so it's a good trade. And this is just essentially an upward sweep, semi-chromatic in places, and we've got the sort of forte piano effect again with uh, heavy brass just pushing right in here and rolled timpani and bass drum. And then, of course, the strings joining in with the winds, pretty much note for note. Listen for how the flutes are held back until they can really contribute meaningfully at fortissimo. Right? There, there's no point in bringing them in early. And also because he wants the oboes not to get swamped by the rest of the winds if they were to all kind of ride over them in doubling the violins here. So, once again, another good choice. Even though... Let's face it, the oboes are really not contributing that much to what the trumpets are doing here. Especially once you have a two trumpets in octaves. There really is not a whole lot that could compete with that or really add to it in a meaningful way, even with a three oboes. You just are making the sound a little bit more piercing is what you end up doing. And the pad is taken over right away by the lower heavy brass. Notice that the time signature is now 2-4, which means that our bump 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 is going to be stretched over three bars in order to make one complete cycle, rather than 3-4, which would be just one bar. Right? Dun, 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 dun. So this becomes syncopated. But the reason why it is 2-4 has to do with this Bum bum ba bum ba da da dum ba bum bum. Right, the reiteration of something that came before. If you remember that massive tutti, probably one of the biggest in the entire piece, was followed by the brass kind of cooling down after they played their chordal tattoo. Correct? So the chordal tattoo is coming back here one more time just to express that sense of aggressive jollity. And they have the double basses for company. Not sure how much that really adds to anything, but once again, just a really fun thing for the double bassists to join in on. Maybe giving a little bit of solidity to the timpani, who are on the same pitch. And um, you know, bass trombone doesn't really need any help at all. And then you've got the tenor trombones playing a G and an E, and the trumpets playing the middle C in the middle of that chord. And... Yeah, it doesn't have the same sense of massiveness as the original tattoo, right? But it still is very effective. So we finally get Osix horns once again, just playing their guts out, 
Triple F, along with the trumpets, who are going all the way up to concert high B flat, A3. <laughs> and sometimes this is interpreted a little bit forte piano. They'll go bum, 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 bum. And that's nice because it adds a dynamic sense to the music. I like also the way that it goes cymbals, bass drum, rather than cymbals at the end, right? So there is no sense of overhang after we have hit the downbeat, which there would be with the cymbals, unless you just go, right, and immediately damp them, which is not always the greatest effect. I feel the orchestration for this page is pretty obvious. It would be fun to break down this massive tutti chord on your own, but I'll give you a little bit of a head start before we wrap things up. Cellos with that same big quadruple stop that we saw a couple pages ago, the same exact chord an octave higher with the violas, and essentially the same chord with violins. This has to be fingered completely, right? So it's a big stretch, and it's nice that Holst gives the violinists a few beats to get their fingers in the exact right position for this. Okay, and then... We've got the timpani playing in um, a perfect fourth, as we've seen before, is pretty effective. That actually goes all the way back to Berlioz. Bass tuba on low C for them. Same thing happening here in bassoons. An octave lower for the contrabassoon. Then just different voicings of that huge C major chord at the end. So we end on a very, very bright, very positive C major. Let's listen to this now and try to notice the difference between the sound of this chord as opposed to its previous entrance and just the wonderful, crisp, bright sound of A2 horns and, and A4 trumpets, trombones, tenor tuba, all joining in on this massive melodic statement. And then, of course, the different points of orchestration that we talked about on the previous screen. Okay, so think about all of those things. We'll have a listen to it now, and I will return with Saturn in just a day or two here on Patreon, and more like, I don't know, several weeks or a couple of weeks on YouTube. And actually, for the Patreon crowd, since I'm in the middle of an enormous project and I have barely enough time to think about anything, I'm actually taking two or three days off right now to edit these lectures on Jupiter and on Saturn. So you will be getting your exclusive content very, very quickly, whereas it's going to be more stretched out in terms of the YouTube releases. So anyhow, thank you so much for joining me for this joyous piece of music. I just feel it's really positive, and it is unstoppable music. So have a listen to the end of this, and I will see you soon.